Welcome to an evening with the Holberg Prize. My name is Hovan Horsta. I'm professor of human geography at uh, the University of Bergen, and I'm also the director for the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation. I'm very happy to be joined by the two laureates uh, here tonight, the two laureates that we celebrate during the, the, uh, the Holberg Week. Uh, the winner of the, the Holberg Prize, Juan Martinez uh, yes. Allier, Professor Emeritus at the Environmental Science and Technology Institute at yeah. the um, uh, Autonomous yeah. University of Barcelona. And uh, Simona Setterberg nielsen Associate Professor uh, at, uh, of Nordic Languages and Literature at Aarhus. University, yeah. um, the winner of this year's Niels Klim uh, uh, Award. Welcome to Bergen, both of you. Um, and in line with Norwegian customs, I'm going to refer to both of you by first name. I uh, hope that's okay. Um, and tonight, uh, I would like to talk about facts, fiction, and the languages that we use uh, to understand reality. You're both from very different fields. But this is an interest uh, that you both um, are interested in, that you both approach from, from different uh, perspectives. So I think we'll have an, an interesting conversation around, uh, around this theme. And Ludwig Holberg was himself uh, a figure who crossed uh, these uh, borders, if we will say, between uh, facts and fiction, working as a professor uh, who also wrote uh, works of, of, of fiction. And I want to start with you, uh, Joan. Um, you have received the prize for your work on, uh, among other things, environmental justice and what you call languages of valuation. Yes. Could you explain to us, uh, in brief terms, what, what are languages of evaluation? Why are they important to focus on? Well, this, is, uh, this expression of valuation languages, according to me, when they were writing a a previous book, which is called The Environmentalist of the Poor, and I was trying to, well, to explain what I am still doing, looking at conflicts around the world, and then influence as an economist on the attempts by economists to put money value, or they would call it perhaps utility value, but just one single measurement of value, not only on the things which are in the market, but also on what they like to call externalities, which in itself is a funny word, because the externalities like climate change are probably bigger if we could measure them than the internalities that go through the market. But anyway, they call these externalities, or they call it environmental services, and there is a big debate on how to put money prices to this, in which people in this country are very much involved, like Karil Vatten in in Oslo and other people, the, for instance, the IPVS, which is similar to the IPCC, but for biodiversity, they have declared themselves to be in favor, officially, so to speak, of, of plural values. Mm -hmm. That you cannot reduce all values to attempts to put money, money valuation on disappearing species, or in the damage to the climate, or on toxic waste, and so on. That we should measure uh, damages to the environment, all the benefits from the environment, nature contributions, as they call it, nature contributions to human welfare, we should measure this in their proper units, different kind of units of account, not in money. Mm -hmm. the, the economists or politicians or other people think that money is a very powerful kind of language of valuation, mm -hmm. and sometimes they say because the minister even the Ministry of the Environment, but probably the Ministry of the Economy of Finances, only understands money valuation, which I think is a good reason to change the minister. <laughs> <laughs> and also it's not true. Ministers are, they have to learn other languages to win the elections and so on. Mm. So uh, that's how it came about, through lots of, of studies, detailed studies, or just the superficial studies, of many conflicts, we see that different people who are in this, involved in these conflicts, for instance, could be Norx uh, Hydro, which I have mentioned already, or uh, Green, what is the name? Green Resources, which is another Norwegian firm which is planting trees in Africa to absorb the carbon dioxide, which would be really a coincidence if this happened. So, uh, 
these firms, because they are uh, business firms, uh, they measure in money terms the profit and loss account, no, and the balance that belong in the in, is always in money terms. But there are other languages of valuation, another protagonist, perhaps the people in Tanzania or Kenya who are subject to displacement because of tree plantations to absorb carbon dioxide, this is a, is a real example, they will use other languages, their own language, no, it's not Norwegian and it's not Catalan, whatever they are saying, they also mean that it's not a question of money compensation only. It's also a question of a mountain which perhaps is sacred or the right to put the cattle in the forest or many other uh, livelihood, no? Livelihood, sacredness, archaeology, archaeological values, uh, in, in general, aesthetic values. Of course, you can reduce this to money if you make an effort. But what for? I mean, it's better to, to be closer to reality and to accept that there are different valuation languages which are incommensurate. They, you cannot measure them in the same units. That's my experience, which is based really on many cases of conflict around the world. Mm, sure. And Simona, uh, you've won the award, uh, among other things, for um, your work on the history of the Danish novel uh, and developing this concept of, of fictionality. Can you explain to us, in the same way, um, what, is, what is the significance of this term? What does it mean? Of fictionality, yeah. Mm. Um, so. Fictionality uh, in the sense that I and my colleagues at the Center for Fictionality Studies at Aarhus University use it is a rhetoric. And that means that today we are used to thinking of fiction as, as genres. So genres as the novel or the fiction movie or the series, video games and so on. But thinking of fictionality as a rhetoric means that it's in one sense a much broader term than genres. It means that uh, we could find the use of fictionality, for example, in um, um, NGOs who, who wanted to um, change the world uh, and then post a picture of uh, the Earth uh, being overheated and personalizing this Earth. And that would be maybe uh, one way of, of bridging our fields, that fictionality is actually used uh, as a strategy in uh, all sorts of, of human communication. Um, and what really is the fundamental part of, of fictionality, as, as I see it, is uh, our ability to invent and to think about non-existent affairs. And I think that's um, a very, very important part of us as, as human beings, that we are able to imagine things uh, that are not here yet mm. <laughs> and maybe never will be. But uh, when it comes to, uh, to climate change, we have a lot of hopes for, for the future. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's one bridge um, that, that could be made uh, between our, our research, uh, research areas. Um, that fictionality is uh, a way to imagine that which is uh, not the case, uh, and it is used within different uh, in different genres, but also uh, in uh, campaigns for climate change, for example. Hmm. I think we have other. No, I wanted to ask something because uh, there is a field now which is called environmental humanities, mm -hmm. which includes environmental history and also environmental literature. Mm -hmm. And many years ago, when I was quite often in Latin America and Peru, I read a book by uh, Arguedas called Todas las Sangres, meaning all the bloods of Peru, meaning the, the invade, the European conquerors, but also the local people, mm -hmm. and all the mixtures, and all the problems. And this novel, Todas, I don't know the translation, All the Bloods, is fiction, totally fiction. Well, it's not totally fiction. That's what I'm, I'm thinking now, what does fiction and facts mean? Because it's a fiction, it's a novel. It's a very gripping novel because it's about this essence of Peru, which is apartheid, in fact, isn't it? There's a system, not legally, but uh, sociologically, of apartheid for the last 500 years. And, and there is a mountain, and they discover copper, and an American US company comes mm. with an English name, of course. And at the end, it ends in a disaster because 
There are two brothers, one wants to keep the hacienda, traditional one, abusing the local Indian people, and the other is very modern, and says, no, no more abusing. We are going to become very rich by mining mm. with my partners from the U.S. And the local people at the end uh, burned the hacienda and burned the church, I think, if I remember rightly. And, but the issue is mining, mm. copper mining, a big hole, mm and what is going to happen with the crops that they need for livelihood, isn't it? Mm. So sacredness does not appear in the novel. But when I read this novel, I was not an ecological economist yet. I was a normal yeah, person. Yeah. Mm. I, was, I was an economic historian, very fond of Peru. Well, I learned that when I was 30 years old in Peru, and I had very good friends. And they were all on the side of Arguedas against Vargas Llosa, who is a more kind of modern, pro-Western kind of novelist, isn't it? Anyway, so to come to the question. This kind of literature yeah. is very close mm. to what we know because, yeah. Yeah. of course, language evaluation or even metabolism could appear in this kind of novels. Yeah, perhaps or, you can help us see or, the facts or understand the facts better. On even point. Though and I think fiction. the other thing is that it communicates much better mm. with mm. the people yeah. if you write yeah. Yeah, I agree fiction with that. narratives yeah. or if mm. you make a film, mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. better even. Yeah, yeah and, and you were also earlier on today talking about how we can change the world um, maybe from outside academia. And I think fiction is a really good example of that. Maybe that movie or novel uh, that we have seen or read will change people's opinions much easier than what we will be discussing today. Um, hopefully we can help change the world as well. But I, I do think that fiction has a certain power um, that might uh, change the, mm -hmm. the view on, on the world as well. Mm -hmm. So. I, I definitely agree. Mm. So do I understand correctly that an implication of your work is that the way we understand what is fiction and what is fact and the borders between them have, have shifted over time and are actually quite, yeah. quite fluid? Well, yeah, um, I wouldn't uh, quite put it that way. I don't think they are fluid as such, uh, at least in my research. I, I mm. try to uh, argue that we can differentiate between uh, fact and fiction. But what I'm arguing is that uh, the genres of, of facts and fiction only came about in the 18th century. Uh, so before that time, it wasn't possible to uh, enter a, a library where you could go to uh, this uh, part of the library and find factual books, and, and over here you had fiction. It was something that was only in the making in the 18th century. Um, and, and I think we have relied on that distinction which came about in the 18th century uh, up until today. And, and right now we do see uh, these kind of movements against uh, factuality or factual discourse. We were talking about fake news earlier as well, and mm. I think that's a really good example of, mm. of how these uh, boundaries are uh, being challenged uh, today. But I think we have a very important uh, job to do as, uh, as academics to try to hold on to these borders and, and historicize them and um, kind of reclaim them, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, one of my main uh, influences when I was became an academic was was, was Foucault, um, and then reading that, I'm not sure if this resonates with the way you're thinking. Is that um, uh, we have had uh, there have been powerful institutions that have been part of shaping w where the mm -hmm. borders are, sort of between yeah. w what is fact and fiction, and when you're left, what you're left with afterwards is that you're thinking, uh, or before you read it, you're thinking, okay, today we have a perfect idea mm -hmm. of what the borders, <laughs> what is fact and what is fiction. Mm -hmm. When you read it, it's like, um, maybe that's not, maybe we don't have those mm -hmm. perfect um, perceptions today. And it's sort of to historicize and contextualize yeah. our current understanding of these things. Yes, yes, I think that's, that's very important. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's relevant to bring in Foucault, definitely. Um, but I, d I do believe that for 300 years or so, uh, we have kind of been relying on more or less uh, solid boundaries between these genres, so to speak. And right now we're talking about being in a post-factual era. And I think um, what I'm trying to do with my work is to look back on, on the period where these borders were first established and see whether there might be some, some answers buried there to how we um, gain trust in, in science uh, again and how we can differentiate between different discourses. Um, 
And well, are there any answers buried there? Yeah, that's a really good <laughs> question. Um, so today I, I quoted some uh, Danish novelists from the, the 18th century, and uh, one of them is uh, um, and he's, um, he's saying that sometimes we uh, get more information from fiction and we re remember uh, fiction um, for a longer period of time uh, than fact. So that's uh, him trying to say that fiction actually uh, has a power and it's important to distinguish between uh, those categories. Um, I think we were also talking in, in my panel about periodicals and uh, one of the funniest things about periodicals of the 18th century is that it's really a mess. Uh, you would find uh, fictional stories on the one side of, of the periodical and then a recipe over here and um, a discussion of how to um, raise uh, your children over here. So it's really a mixture of all sorts of, of discourses uh, and genres. Um, and then it is uh, in, in the course of the 18th century that we get uh, this distinction between genres that hold factual discourses and, and um, those that hold fictional discourses. Um, and I think the, the branding um, and the, the labeling of those uh, different um, genres and those who have to kind of um, be accountable for the difference between these different discourses might be something we could learn from uh, today. In one sense, the internet reminds me a lot of the periodicals, right? Because you can find everything there and it's not easy to, to distinguish between what's fact and what's fiction and what might be fake news online. So you might compare the internet to the periodicals. I've been having that thought sometimes, uh, at least. Um, and then I guess uh, it's really hard to find answers to the, the current mistrust in science and the distinctions. But if I were to do so, I think the best answer was, would probably be to uh, kind of be better at, at fact checking and to have someone be being accountable for, for what's there and um, not, not finding too many anonymous uh, pages uh, online or uh, discourses that we can't ascribe to an author. Um, so those would be kind of preliminary answers, trying to sure, yeah. dig them up from the 18th yeah. century. I want to come back to this, this notion of post-truth and the internet and what it's doing to our understanding of facts and, and fiction. Uh, but first, uh, Joan, you've been, um, in part of your work, uh, quite critical of, uh, I'm still on the theme of sort of power and who creates the, the, our facts, right? Um, uh, of the discipline of economics, uh, both sort of as an instit institution, uh, in academia, uh, and, and as a discourse, and how that has shaped our understanding of, of what are the Im important facts in, in, in society. Can you speak to that a little bit, and, and, and how do you think um, uh, you know, the, 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 the establishment of, of, of certain disciplines have been important in, in creating what we consider to be facts? Well, I'm going to say this, uh, talk about this more tomorrow, but I think that economics, uh, what it did it from the uh, from early on, since it became like established science with Adam Smith and so on, and all focus on the market and how prices are forming the market, is, no? and then how the economy would grow in the case of Adam Smith because of the division of labor, and then with other theories about innovation and so on, but with a kind of language from economics. Economic concepts would be able in a kind of rather metaphysical way, to explain the growth of the economy. And already many years ago, and more and more, there are people who are saying, well, now there is an energy crisis. In the 70s, there was another energy crisis. So, well, there is always an energy crisis. You cannot explain the economy, the real economy, the real, real economy, not the market economy without looking at the flows of energy and the flows of materials, because they go together, roughly speaking, with the growth of the economy, isn't it? And changes in the energy system are going to uh, mean changes in the uh, economy also of the market. It's not that, that through uh, economic theory explanations you can go on trying to explain what will happen with the real, real economy, as I call it. This to simplify. You Apart need to from explain this, that, I think, to the audience. What, what's the difference between the, real, the economy, the real economy, and the real, real economy? Now that there is some, <laughs> some inflation, that the prices are going up, 
the economists are fond of saying, no, in real terms, and they mean discounting the 5%, 10% inflation, then we have this GDP. No, in real terms mean discounting the effect of the price of the of the inflation of the, of the increase in the money, and the real real economy, which is not a technical name yet, <laughs> has not succeeded, <laughs> means what is behind, below below. No, in like in a building, you have the the building is working, but below the the building you have all the the, the electricity and the water coming in and out, uh, the wastewater coming out. So this is the real economy, the metabolic part of the economy. I call it the real, real mm -hmm. economy, but it means materials and energy. And it's a bit funny that sometimes economies, economies realize that there is an energy crisis, no? as if it was a pota potato price crisis or something. Or, um, no? it's, not, it's more basic than this, when economy no can work without flows of energy. And, but this, on the other hand, what I am saying now myself, I am listening to myself and thinking, what about <laughs> fiction? What about, for instance, science fiction, that we call it science fiction? Perhaps there are people who read science fiction. I don't read much science fiction, but it's, it's a literary genre, which is, well, I think Nils Klim yeah. is a bit of science it is fiction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. sun is subterranean. <laughs> this is really fiction, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so on. He didn't come the metabolism, I mean, but he was, <laughs> ra he was a rationalist, no? An enlightenment. Anyway, so science fiction, well, you can invent whatever you want. You can invent the that energy can be recycled indefinitely, for instance, mm -hmm. or that there will be a miraculous, but miraculous is uh, mm -hmm. mi is not scientific. If you say miraculous, it means something a bit mm -hmm. non-scientific, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Miraculous source of energy that we provide everything, no? like the manna in the Bible or something like this. Therefore, that, uh, well, one could, should criticize the economist, I think, come back to the real, real economy and also to the issues of distribution and the conflict social, the socio-ecological question, climate change and so on. The issues of valuation, this is what I know. But be aware, of course, that there are changes in technology and that there is some reason, which this would be a question for you, why this body of work on science fiction is growing so much, no? Is this that something else is coming to, or is... Yeah. It also depends on the time. If we're talking about the next 100 years, very different if we're talking about the next 4 billion years that the Earth is going to exist, isn't it? More or less. But science fiction, I don't know how you... Yeah, yeah possible, it is. the growth. Yeah, I'm not sure this is your field, but... Uh. <laughs> well, kind of, I guess. Well, it is true that... I that, know that, that you that say, no, I am in the 18th century, but anyway, you are also in the 21st century. That's nice. Um, it is true that Nils Klim is a kind of science fiction, so that's um, interesting in itself. And um, I've tried to show how many of the first novels actually are about science, and they are kind of a science fiction genre. So that's really interesting in, in itself, and I think there's, there's a reason for that. And right now in literature, we actually see a kind of return to science fiction uh, again, and it's not just something that you would try to kind of hide behind your other more um, kind of um, high-class books is actually becoming a more uh, popular genre that's um, also interesting for um, academics. Uh, so um, I, I do see this trend uh, actually of, of science fiction being on the rise, and I think it it does connect to the current climate change. Actually, that we kind of try to find new uh, ways of using our imagination, imagining a world that that could be better than the one uh, we are in right now. So I think that's a perfect example of how the situation that we're in now in, in real life actually uh, is kind of mirrored in, in fiction, uh, but also this, of course, not a perfect mirror. There's something added to that, uh, a dream of escape, but also um, a way of using imagination to come up with maybe some solution at least. So I think it's a, it's a very timely yeah, it's comment. I think science fiction, for instance, science fiction, I think, inspires 
For instance, Definitely. there is one novel I read by Ursula Le Guin. Many people have read The Dispossessed, isn't it, by Ursula Le Guin. And it inspires mm-hmm. the whole degrowth movement. They yeah. like it. Well, yeah. I like it. But in other hand, it's science fiction. Science fiction is a contradiction. You cannot have mm-hmm. science fiction because <laughs> science implies hypotheses, experiments, going to the lab, doing some chemical reactions. <laughs> so how you can, can have really science fiction? You know, in one sense, we use our uh, how can imagination. You talk to the scientists that, about science fiction. But when you are in the laboratory, or if you are a scientist, I think you use your imagination all yes. the time when coming up with new hypotheses and speculations and so on. So maybe science and fiction are closer connected than, than one would uh, presume. Yeah, I'm not sure you need me here, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if I can throw in a question. Um, no, I think this is a good um, a- example of how literature really can mm-hmm. help us. So I work more on the, the science side, social science, uh, in, in climate change. And one of the, the concepts that we work with directly or indirectly is this idea of future imaginaries. So mm-hmm. we don't, uh, it, it's harder, so we have, I think, sort of a working hypothesis that's harder to, to t- transform because we don't really know where we're going and we don't have very clear uh, or consensus around what the future uh, imagine or what, what, what our imaginary of the future um, uh, will be. And I think that this is a precisely a point where, where fiction and creativity and literature can really help us in trying to, to see a, sort of a, a path forward and also um, yeah, create some sort of direction to, mm. to, uh, mm. to uh, climate transformation or other transformations dealing with um, challenges like that. Oh, yeah, I'm glad <laughs> you think so. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know if that was more a comment than a it question. Was maybe, a but, comment, but, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an <laughs> invitation for reflection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we, we often tend to think that, that science is over here and then fiction is, is over here and fact is over here and then fiction over here. But um, our ability to, to imagine that, which is not the case right now, uh, is really important in, in all uh, types of, of sciences, I think. And this is also a new project that I will embark on uh, when I return to uh, my university I- in Aarhus. But, um, what I want to investigate is definitely the role that uh, fictionality and imagination plays within various uh, scientific uh, discourses. And so I'm really happy to hear that, <laughs> that you've had that uh, experience uh, as well. Yeah, sure. John, you've, you've touched on this a little bit already, but I wanted to ask you uh, if there's any works of fiction that have really inspired you. Well, I mentioned this, Ursula Le Guin, that yeah. is possessed, mm-hmm. and indirectly, I suppose, many other... Well, I mentioned already two novels, yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's, that's enough <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> that's enough, no. <laughs> okay, moving on. I'm crossing that question out. No. Uh. <laughs> when I read novels, I feel a bit guilty, to tell the truth, because I think I have to write some more academic uh, articles. But of course, I read novels. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, uh, a, a novel that has been uh, discussed a lot in our uh, field uh, is a recent one called Ministry of the Future, yeah, which yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with. But uh, that really sort of creates a, a sort of a horror vision of, of the climate changes we're facing, but also like, uh, yeah, some sort of a path towards um, transformation. Mm. Now, um, okay, so... Uh, well, if we go back to the language of evaluation, sure. because there is one language of evaluation, I mentioned sacredness, because I am more or less on Holbert's line of the Enlightenment, so religion, I left religion aside myself a long time ago. But one sees, as an anthropologist uh, would do, that people have religious beliefs, also in Norway, some people, but very often in other places. And sometimes they are quite nasty. For instance, in India, the upper caste in India believes that the water is sacred in order to simplify, to exclude the Dalits from having water. No? Religion can be, well, being from, from Spain and thinking of the Catholic kings in Spain and the Inquisition and so on, one feels quite strongly sometimes against imposing religion. But the truth is that religious values, even religious people, like a Christian priest from liberation theology in Latin America, or Buddhist in the others, in Tibet and North, Southeast Asia, quite often we find in the others, in the, that the 
people intervening in the conflicts sometimes are monks, isn't it? Monks which are defending the people against companies or against the government. And I don't know what, how to deal with this, because the arguments they are using could be totally fictitious, isn't it? Well, religious. I think it's pretty fictitious religion. It's invented. Well, for, yeah, many things. A lot of science is also invented in the Foucault sense, isn't it? But we call this a uh, bit false science, isn't it? But the religion, that people believe in religion, and they use religion to say these trees are sacred, or this uh, mountain, the apples in the Andes, are sacred, and the apples, the high mountains, which are snowed, now the, no, the, the snow is disappearing because of climate change, and all this is mixed up with uh, what is environmental sociology or political ecology. So you cannot do political ecology really without listening to the many evaluation languages, including some which are not uh, scientific in that sense. Mm -hmm. Even most of them are not scientific. They are identity or what we could call more feelings, more than reasoning, isn't it? So this is the reality. It's uncomfortable in a way, mm -hmm. but this is what it is. You cannot say this is not in a cost-benefit analysis or a proper environmental impact assessment, we're going to leave aside religion. Well, you're making violence against the people who believe in religion. Or Holbrook who said, still believe in religion. Still believe in religion. But I mean, this seems to go on and on. Mm. So I got, uh, I became much more respectful of this kind of thing. Sure, sure. So yeah. I asked John uh, if there were works of fiction that had inspired him. This may be a bit more challenging, but uh, are there works of science that have, that have inspired you? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, so I do uh, see the humanities as a science as, sure, as sure, well. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I could... I, I could mean, like science, <laughs> science. <laughs> science lines. Science uh, lines. Um, well, so um, what, what would... Uh, so do the hard sciences? The, uh, you, can, you can define <laughs> it however you want. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well... Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. Well, it, you you could say that Holberg was also a scientist of of his day, so that would be a way of uh, kind of <laughs> returning to him and and maybe twisting your question a, a yeah. bit. But um, but it, it has been a great inspira inspiration to me to um, to work with uh, an era where the boundaries of uh, science and uh, fiction and so on are not as, as clearly set as, as they are today, and to investigate um, <coughs> authors who were authors of fiction as, as well uh, of authors as uh, of, of science. So in that sense, I I could say yes, um, but not I, I guess in the strictly uh, hard science way of. Um, of, of thinking about science. Um. So just out of curiosity, when you read a novel, can you read a novel for uh, as a, sort of on your spare time, or do you always sort of take it in with your <laughs> academic lenses on? Yeah, I think I must say that I always kind of read it as um, uh, as an academic. Uh, it's hard not not to um, at least to some degree, and it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy literature, but um, it's hard for me not to. Um, I guess use my analytical skills uh, when I when I read literature. Um, but for me, it's 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 it, it just means that I get more from the literature. I think than if I could just kind of um, pause that part of my brain. Mm -hmm. So um, it it doesn't for me really um, make it a bad reading experience. Mm. Good. So uh, one uh, topic I wanted to discuss is that we have touched on this already, but uh, it said that we live in a post-truth uh, society, whether or not that's true. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges to, let's say, the authority of science, um, uh, coming from, from, from different angles. Um, and uh, I'm curious about your thoughts. What is our role as academics within this, th this context? Mm. Right? Um, how do we... Um, Sort of maintain this, let's say, the, the legitimacy or, or perhaps authority even of of, uh, of academic knowledge and of facts mm. in this context. 
I'm not sure he wants to. Well, in the morning we already discussed this with it and the post-normal science and this kind of, of uh, events or situations, which are not all situations, in which there is, there is a lot of uncertainty, scientific uncertainty about is, uh, for instance, well, in the environmental field, but industrial environmental field, all the debate about asbestos, for instance, has been going on since the 30s or before. Some people said this is going to damage people. People working in the factories, they knew that this would happen. The authorities came later, and not so long ago, in Casal Monferrato near Torino, there was a court case, and now there is a at least in the north of the planet, not in India, for instance, yet a kind of consensus, no scientific consensus, but based on experience. But this is an example in which science has evaluated the situation to simplify. But there are many others in which science cannot evaluate the situation. I think that sometimes what happens also, since we are talking about humanities and so on, is something which uh, we have not discussed in the morning, is that reluctance of people in the so-called humanities to engage really with science. is not our case, I think, here, but it happens even with the denominations in the universities. For instance, environmental history, the rectors of the university don't know whether to put it in the faculty of science or in the faculty of humanities, and therefore they have never a good place, isn't it? No, I hope this university is an exception to this. But <laughs> even in geography, since we are talking to you, there are geographers calling themselves uh, physical geographers, and others human geographers. I call, I call them human geographers and inhuman geographers. <laughs> I'm writing which, that down. Which I understand <laughs> because there was geography in some sense before there were humans. Of course, nobody said the word geography, which is in Greek, but it doesn't matter whether it's Greek or not, because you could not talk because there were no humans, isn't it? There could some, and be, perhaps they thought about it, mm. but not as we know. Anyway, so that's one excuse. But there is no other excuse to separate human geography and inhuman <laughs> geography. They should be taught together and so on. Therefore, what I would, my own taste is to get more science into, into what we do, but with the limits to science that we discussed in the morning, not saying the scientists have spoken and all is clear. Well, it's not true. Asbestosis was not true, and there are so many other examples in which the scientists, if they are honest, they have to say, we don't know yet, isn't it? Or we'll never know, and so on. Mm -hmm. But it's very different from fake truth, which is more the kind of Trump kind of thing. Or yeah. The negation of climate change, despite the evidence, at least not the evidence, perhaps, of, for instance, the Gulf Stream, I'm not sure whether it's stopping or not. You will notice it in Bergen if it does. <laughs> But uh, the killing curve of the concentration of carbon dioxide, how can you negate this, isn't it? This becomes very irrational and very unenlightened. Mm -hmm. So I think that more science, especially would be good, would be less separation between the science. Mm -hmm. Could we call in the morning the orchestration of the sciences, or mm -hmm. including humanities, or the mm -hmm. choreography? Each with its language, but cross, talking across. Which you to, have really succeeded To in solve doing. issues, to solve issues mm -hmm. if possible, but then, and to understand history. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, another example from near here, Volcano belongs to the social sciences or to the natural sciences? Well, it depends. A volcano today in Iceland, if it explodes, which let's hope doesn't happen very often, well, it becomes a real issue in social sciences. Isn't it? But of course, there was a science of volcanoes before humans, except that there was no science because there were no humans. <laughs> but volcanoes are much older. So this is something I have never solved myself, how to bring this together. I can say this, how to do it. Well, yeah. the proof of the cake, I don't think it's just the eating. Is, There'll uh, be your next paper on it, volcanoes. It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> Simona, any thoughts on this? So the question was about uh, the role of academics in yeah, this yeah. post-truth era. 
Joanne, you have really proven how <laughs> this could be a solution, bringing different fields together. So it's kind of hard to follow up on that, I guess. But um, I think we need to talk to <laughs> to people outside academia more. When I um, when I um, do kind of um, talks where I engage with people outside academia, I. Uh, always met by um, people who are really engaged in in the topics that I that I um, teach or, or talk about, and I think we we have to do that uh, much more. And that's of course uh, on on the one level, and there's another level which is maybe even uh, more difficult to handle, and that's uh, the politicians who are skeptical uh, towards uh, science. Uh, I'm part of something called uh, the Young Academy, where we have an internal uh, kind of agreement with politicians. So a, f a politician can come and see what it means to be a, a scientist for a day, and we can come and see what it means to be a politician for a day. And uh, that's kind of one step uh, towards uh, trying to bridge that gap, which um, often occurs between uh, decision makers and, and scientists and the scepticism towards uh, science, scientists. And, and I think it's often the case that they really just don't know what we are doing, right? So we have to be open uh, towards um, discussions and uh, conversations uh, on, on different uh, levels, uh, really. Um, yeah, mm. so... So I think that that would probably be my uh, my answer mm. um, to that. So, what kind of uh, engagement would you say have been most important to you, or what sort of? I know you've been involved in discussions about university politics mm. and things like that. Can you speak a little bit about that? Like, what what sort of um, issues have been? Uh, are there issues that you've kind of drawn from your work that you have engaged uh, around, and how have you done that? Um, well, so I, I guess the question of fact and fiction and fake news and so on is. Um, probably the topic I've uh, talked uh, about the most and which draws attention from a, a wider uh, audience because it really, as you said, in the light of Trump has become um, on everybody's lips really. It's, it's something that we discuss all the time. How can we differentiate between these discourses? So that's probably the topic I've talked uh, about the most, um, I would say. Mm. But, but I also wanted to, if I, if sure. I may, um, so I was, I was thinking about uh, how, how do we change the world really as a, academics and it seems that your approach is to um, talk to NGOs and um, uh, that you also have a kind of an activism uh, component to your research. Um, how, do, how do you do that? How, well, uh, how can you actually be a researcher and also uh, an activist? I, I would love to know that. I would like, mm. like to be <laughs> one myself, I guess. How, how is that possible to unite these two occupations? No. Well, I mean, young enough to join Greta Thorberg. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the young girls against. Uh, no, but uh, I mean, I don't talk to NGOs. I listen to NGOs, actually, mm. or, to, or to what do we call EGOs, Environmental mm. Justice Organization, mm. local ones. But also, if I can, I would listen to more indigenous people here, for instance, in the Arctic, isn't it? Mm. Despite mm. the difficulties of the. Mm different languages mm -hmm. and and well it seems to me obvious that if you want to learn about the world you have to listen yeah. to the, yeah. to the different people mm -hmm. but uh, i was also thinking about this fake uh, not the fake news but the fake history that we're still struggling in, in, in for instance in europe or in the world how to get a consensus history i would say that consensus is good by itself but for instance, the whole question being from Barcelona, in Barcelona there is, as you, many of you have been, at the end of the Ramblers, there is a statue of Columbus. And I have said very several times in writing that I, I would, because I am old and radical, and I can say whatever I like now with the Holbrook place even more, <laughs> that they should, I don't know what Holbrook has thought of this, we should take Columbus out of the column, leave the column, take Columbus to the Marita to the museum, because he knew how to sail better than I do, for instance. He knew a lot, and he has merits, isn't he? And put somebody else on top. Who? Well, this would be something that would be a very lively discussion. But be quite this, which is an eccentricity, because there is now enough 
in Spain, because of the history of Spain, because Franco also, and so on, there has not been a general awareness in environmental history and epidemiological in history that the arrival of the Europeans to America could have been the Portuguese or could have been the, the Vikings if they had stayed there a longer time, perhaps, was a, a, a biological disaster. There was a biological invasion and many people died of the measles and what do call the viruela now, all these illnesses that... Uh, that they had no immunity. But this, I didn't know this from school. Nobody taught me in school in Spain. And I learned this by reading later, uh, Alfred Crosby, environmental history, already as a grown up, and teaching this. So this is a case in my own experience, and there will be many other examples around the world, how to interpret the uh, Hindu religion politically in India, which is not a minor issue for the world in general whether the Adivasis were there before, or whether the Adivasis, meaning the original people, are not really Adivasis, they are Bambasis, meaning people of the forest, and therefore you can dispose of them easily to simplify the debate in India from the Gandhian, so to speak, on the side of the Adivasis to some extent, and the Hindu, the Hindutva people now in government. So how to interpret the history? Mm. So fake mm. news, well, fa fake old news mm. are also mm. important. Mm. Also for this country, for instance, yeah. with the you ratify Convention mm. 169 of ILO, as you did in Norway, but not in Sweden, yeah. because a lack of awareness mm. of your history, isn't it? Yeah. You're humble. I, I would. I mean, my reading of this of your work and and the interaction with activists would be that you have gone out and done field work in different places, uh, both of uh, farmers but also social movements, and been inspired by them. The Chipko movement, for example, yes. uh, and then uh, you have created concepts that have been uh, important, I think, to visualize and, and make more visible um, their realities. Uh, and uh, that has become important to analyze uh, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Uh, and I think in some cases they've also used those concepts to, to, to further their, their, uh, their, their, their struggles. So I think that may, perhaps you haven't been sort of uh, out in the streets that much, but I think, you're, you're, uh, it's, I think your work is a good example of how um, academic uh, practice can help uh, with social justice struggles around the world. Activists very seriously, because you, you, for instance, you cannot become an, I cannot become an activist mm -hmm. in India because I cannot go to a village unless there was like you know in some some kind of miraculous technology in which which might come not so in which I speak Catalan and people listen in Hindi or in other many of the dialects. <laughs> this might come with Google or somebody some other company in 100 years time before, but not, this is not the case. Mm. So if you are a foreigner, you are a foreigner of different degrees, isn't it? I could not become an activist even in Copenhagen, I mean, unless I live 10 years in Copenhagen, I learn the language, which is not impossible, because I, I, I look more or less uh, mm. native, quite good. This, <laughs> this guy is myself, um, long hair, good hair. but, uh, Activism is a very serious kind of thing, mm. dangerous sometimes, mm. and very, well, it's like being, like the peasant rebellions in, in Europe, and our own history has been made by, by, I wouldn't say class conflict just in that, as a slogan, but by social conflicts in which some people were activists of some cause, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes wrong cause, but sometimes, what we would call, for instance, well, this morning I mentioned feminism, isn't it? To be a feminist activist in Iran is not a joke, isn't it? Mm. It's not a joke. It's, it's very dangerous and they are killing them. And therefore this is happening. And in Argentina, where things are more relaxed, being a feminist activist for abortion rights is not a joke. Mm. It's not a joke because there are anti-feminist people also. So all social movements 
the leaders, but not the leaders in the sense of the Lenins of social movements, but the grassroots, as we call it, of social movements are the people who are moving the world, I think, and they have been moving the world, and I hope this will happen with the environmental movement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is almost lyric fiction, isn't it? <laughs> Poetry. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe in this. Great. Um, I want to talk about uh, the university as an institution and as a place um, to develop these kinds of ideas that you're, you're working on. You've both been um, recognized for your work and for your ideas, so um, you've, you've obviously had some success within the institution of the university. But um, uh, I, I want to change to you uh, now. Um, to, um, so to what extent do you think the university today works as an institution to, 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 um, to facilitate the work you're doing? Um, yeah, so of course there have been a lot of cut downs within the humanities in recent years. Um, so it, it means um, that um, we have to find new ways of um, getting time to do research, uh, research and we have to um, apply for funding much more than uh, we did 10 years ago. Um, and there's a bad side to that. Uh, I think a lot of uh, researchers now, they um, do a lot of writing that's not read by anyone but the ones that decide whether they are going to receive money or not. Um, but the, the positive side is that it, it forces you to rethink uh, your ideas and to, um, I guess, continue to, to grow as a researcher because you, have to, you can't be stuck in one area. You have to uh, rethink what you're, what you're doing and um, have to come up with projects that are relevant not only to you but to, um, to I guess, the, the greater society in, uh, in some sense. Um, so um, there's both a, a kind of negative and a positive side in uh, the direction that the, the university has, has taken um, as I see it. Mm. So for you to choose an academic career, has that been sort of a... Uh, have you known from the beginning mm -hmm. that this is what you wanted to do? Or uh, well, has it been a... Yeah. yeah, pretty much, actually, <laughs> and that's rare, I think. Uh, most uh, academics are like, yeah, I actually wanted to do something else. Uh, originally, I wanted to be uh, a writer of fiction, but that was when I was <laughs> a kid. Uh, and, and I guess when I realized that it was possible to be a writer of facts, uh, that was uh, really what I wanted to, <laughs> wanted to do. Um, so I, I did uh, pursue an academic career quite early on, um, and I've just loved it all the way, so. <laughs> Great. Joan, um, you've been in the university, uh, in academia for a, a long time. I dare to say a very long time. And <laughs> how would you say the university as an institution has changed uh, well, over, over like that time? I was, first in Barcelona, it was very bad because it was, well, many people went into Exiled Republicans, yeah. and so it was an exceptionally so bad Franco, situation Franco still yeah. in Europe. Uh, it was also very bad in, in Portugal, for instance. And Portugal belonged to the NATO, which is really NATO. Anyway, this is another issue. But I escaped, so like, more or less like Manuel Castells also did when in our early 20s. He would escape even earlier, but he was only 20 years old. And he went to Paris, and then he became a big sociologist, which is his another Holbert Prize, Manuel Castells. And we have like uh, similar backgrounds in that sense of escaping from Spain, uh, just because. And then I went to England, and I spent ten years in Oxford in St Anthony's College, off and on, with British gold, which was not very abundant, to tell the truth. And going to Latin America to do books, well, as you know this, about agrarian issues, first in southern Spain, which was a bit dangerous, and then in Peru and Cuba also. That's how I, I was. I was an agrarian historian or agrarian I don't know, economist, agricultural economist. And then through this, I became interested in the environment and in energy issues from ecological anthropology, because I did economics of food consumption also. So I knew about calories and protein and so on, which is was a bit strange for. Well, nobody pushed me to do this, but somebody helped me, especially in, in Oxford, where I got first a student and then a research fellowship. And then I went, went back to Spain and I got a chair. And everything was all right in a way, except that I was in the Faculty of Economics 
and it was very difficult to teach ecological economics. And they were writing books of ecological economics, and there was more sort of impact, not a lot, but more impact outside than in my own university. Because universities, this was the post-Franco universities, much better. But as all the universities, they are divided into silos, no? into departments, and people fight for the succession inside the departments, no? little monarchies in a way. <laughs> and of course, there has been many attempts to do bigger departments to fight this kind of, of chair system, but it's very difficult to to do, for instance, environment. There have many students with very good doctorates, many publications, perhaps too many even, to trying to make a name for themselves or because they have many ideas also. And, and they go to sociology and they say, what are you? Well, perhaps I am an environmental sociologist, but they are environmental social scientists and there is no department of environmental social science. There are some in the Netherlands, some in the States, so it's, it's, but as I, sometimes I, I ask myself, it's put easy to investigate this, how biochemistry came into being, for instance, or when radioactivity was discovered, they didn't know whether to put them in the Department of Chemistry or Physics, isn't it? At the end they had to do something for the particle physicists because they were both think at the same time. So universities change, but they change more, slower than reality, I think, <laughs> or the perception of reality. <laughs> and with the environment, some people have been at the vanguard of this discussion. Well, sometimes I mention here the Swedes. I mean, Anne-Marie Johnson from the ASCO laboratory, she showed me once a Renius statue in the 80s, and Arrhenius discovered the greenhouse effect or was one of them already at the end of the 19th century. So there is a tradition in Sweden, in Sweden which I think has something to do with the social movement now, but also Carl Folke, well, and other people here, Carl Eric Eriksson in Sweden, but uh, other people in Norway. I mean, Scandinavia has been a place for this. But how they get places, well, at the end it works, because you have the Cicero Institute in, in Oslo, isn't it? So this, but it's, it's more costly in, in terms of, uh, of uh, having, getting places than it should be. It should be, I don't know how, to, a more agile system in which uh, you, I don't know how it should be, more democratic on the one hand and more open to new things. Mm. For instance, you must be a kind of, I don't know what, if you get this prize now, you have got a few points, extra points. <laughs> <laughs> I but, hope so. Yeah. But <laughs> How many points did you get for this award? <laughs> and this you were perhaps no a rara, a rara avis, but uh, knowledge increases because of the of, of the novelties and things. Yeah. Yeah. And the universities are not always for novelty; they should be. They should be. Mm. Yeah. I want to open up uh, for questions. We're going to have some water over here, and then um, there are microphones. So uh, if anyone has any questions, we can take them. Uh, please be very brief and state your name and purpose. Yes, there's one over here. I'm Nils Johan from Copenhagen. Thank you for your contributions. I originally was a part of the World Social Forum. You know, after the Battle of Seattle at the ministerial WTO meeting in 1999, activists from Brazil came to Paris to Le Monde Diplomatique, and uh, practitioners and academics wanted to work together because we wanted to unite global civil society. And uh, this morning, and not now, I've heard the word civil society. And I think as well in our OECD countries, but also in Russia, in China, in the Muslim countries, we have to 
find ordinary people for coming together because we are in a huge crisis. So my question is, have you any visions, any imaginations about how we can go further? Because now it's not uh, t 10 minutes to 12, but uh, maybe it's one minute to 12. Thank you. How do we save the world? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, of course I believe in this civil society in the sense that I think Tocqueville talk of, because some people said civil society in Hegel's sense of the business people or in Tocqueville's sense of the, of the democratic associations and so on. I say this because I just published an article in something called the Tocqueville Review and, and I learned this difference. And, well, I am for the civil society organized in associations, in NGOs, in, and more than, I said this in the morning, or together with, but perhaps more than in the public policies from the governments, whether it's the European Commission or whether it's, because I see, it, for instance, with the COPs, that nothing has been done really about climate change. And the, or perhaps the municipal level would be the appropriate one. But I agree that it's an urgent thing to do. And, but I think in part it comes from the mind of the people that the, what they learn, these debates about the science of, of the environment and climate change, but other from an urgency to act. And I think there are, who can act? I think perhaps the young people. And this is, has not happened so often in history, I think that the young people now realize that they have power because they are young and they have energy because they are young, but also because they, their future is in trouble, isn't it? Compared to us, the generation of the 60s, for instance. The future is very much in trouble and they feel this, and it's a pity that the pandemics stop a little bit the whole movement of Fridays for Future and all this, which I said in the morning, extends to the world. There is uh, several young girls in India, Kenya, who uh, are the greater, well, the journal is called the Greater Thurberg of Kenya. Well, it's the other way around. Greater Thurberg is the, is the uh, I don't remember now, but it's like the Disha Ravi of, of Sweden, isn't it? It's a, je, this, this movement of the youth, I don't know whether you believe in this. These people were not in the forums of Porto Alegre or perhaps they were in Seattle, the first one. The, the other thing would be the poor people of the world, the indigenous people of the world. The indigenous people are 5% in the official accounts in the world, the indigenous people, official indigenous people. But they are forty percent of the cases in the Alas have indigenous protagonists because they live at the frontiers of extraction or because now they have a new sense of identity. And then the the other rest of the people, the new generations and the poor of the people who are being sort of uh, suffer already from all these things or they have been suffering and they don't benefit from anything, or they are not really benefiting from, from the improvements that there are in the world, isn't it? I mean, for instance, the distribution of carbon dioxide emissions is very much unequal. There is like the 1% it is that we, pro we produce the 50% of the emissions, and the lower, uh, say, 10%, they produce the 1% of the emissions. So these are facts which have to do with ecological debts or environmental liabilities, which is questions of the languages that we use. Isn't it? So who are the protagonists? Well, this would be a very good question. A good question. And I, I have some ideas, but I don't know uh, the solution. In the morning, there was a little bit of discussion. I don't believe, I believe in the organization or disorganization of the feminist movement which is making progress in the world, not in having a Politburo or, or a central committee of the environmental movement, or well, international in the sense of the Comintern or anything like this, because this, will, this ends up with fights for power in these organizations. And power is as bad as 
as capitalist for the, for the world. Power is worse, I think. We have time for a couple of more questions. I see one up there. And uh, I'm looking for a second hand, if someone else has a question. Uh, hi, my name is Anders. Uh, and I wonder, uh, you mentioned degrowth uh, earlier. And uh, do you think degrowth is possible in a capitalistic world economy? And if you do, how? Uh, thank you. Did you get the question? This is what André Gortz uh, asked in 72, 1972, in a meeting on the Club of Rome report and so on. He said, I am for decroissance. And I wonder myself, said André Gortz then, uh, whether the growth is going to be compatible with capitalism. And he said, I don't know. Uh, uh, but I mean, many years have passed, so I should say I know a little bit, but I'm not quite sure because I think that capitalism is motivated by the profit motive, isn't it? To accumulation of money to make more money. This is what the system is. You don't need the capitalists to be in command, for instance, in China, the famous Jack Ma, who was a uh, an entrepreneur, a top one, with Alibaba, isn't it? He's been dismissed, and he now lives in exile. So the power of political parties, well, as we know all from the history of fascism in Europe, isn't it? So this can be very bad for people and for nature, for everybody, power of the powerful. But to answer the question, I don't know what I suspect not, that capitalists, not only because of the technologies, because you can say technologies can change a little bit, no? less carbon dioxide and more electrical things, which in itself is, 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 uh, is not so clear that this might happen. But uh, capital is bad because of this instinct of accumulation, yeah, of profits, isn't it? So. We have time for one final uh, question, and I see one up here. I have a question for Simona. And because you said whenever you read novels, you always put the analytical mind, I was wondering if you've read something recently of climate sci-fi fiction, well, climate science fiction, or something to do more with utopia, utopic or dystopic fiction in the current generation, which is kind of predicting a little bit about the planetary boundaries or climate change, or if you would have some comments on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, I, my examples would be from uh, a, a Danish uh, context. Uh, and I think I would uh, maybe mention Olga Raun, uh, who has written a novel uh, called uh, The Employed. Um, and it's really a sci-fi uh, where um, we don't really know who the protagonists are, but she has uh, made this imaginary world where uh, there are kind of stuff speaking uh, and we don't know what the stuff is and whether it's human made or whether it is uh, humans or not and this is maybe one of the, the things that, that come to mind because I think it kind of challenges the whole uh, question of uh, I guess what is our role as, as human beings um, what would it be in an ideal world or a dystopian uh, world and it's kind of hard to say whether this novel is a uh, uh, utopian novel or, or the opposite um, and going back to, to my first example Nils Klim, you could maybe say the same uh, about that uh, and that's one of the, the most um, interesting things I, I think um, pertain to novels like that. It, it might be sometimes difficult to say is this a, a dystopian or uh, the opposite uh, type, of, type of novel because it, it, it might um, give us new perspectives on um, on the, on the future, but it might also kind of uh, show us uh, the current crisis that, that we're in uh, right now. And I think that novel is a good example of that. But the 18th century novel, this clip, is, is also a good um, example of that. Um, so um, the, the history uh, of fiction has really uh, proven uh, uh, that it has, it has uh, embraced um, questions of um, of uh, environmentalist uh, crisis from um, an early time on, and, and it still does. So thanks so much for that question. Great. Our time, unfortunately, has run out. I want to thank you both, Simona and Joan, for taking the time to, uh, 
spend this evening with Holberg Price uh, with us. Congratulations again on your uh, awards, um, and thanks again. Thank you so much.